So thank you for joining us for our talk with um, Pilar Aguero Esparza. I am Beverly Rayner. I am the director and curator at Cabrillo Gallery. With me is my new colleague, Elise Ororica, who is the new Pro Gallery, uh, Cabrillo Gallery program coordinator. And our featured artist, Pilar Aguero Esparza, whose stunning, very stunning and thought-provoking exhibition stratum is currently on view at Cabrillo Gallery. Let's get that slideshow started, Elise. Okay. Great. All right. Technical shuffling here on my part, and we'll get going here. All right. Um, so go ahead and hit play on that, Elise. So we're seeing just the slides very far left end of the artwork above it. Sorry. Go to the left uh, top menu where it says play it right oh, above the it's just there hidden under my bar. There we go. There you go. All right. Challenging Elise with operating this tonight. All right. So um Pilar Aguero Esparza's inquiry begins with the materials and processes specific to growing up in a shoemaking family. In the crafted tradition of Mexican huarache sandal making, repetitive gestures such as the weaving of, weaving of leather, sorry about that, the hammering of nails and the painting of finishing details make up her current practice. Next slide. The physical presence and signifying potential of these materials and gestures inspire Pilar to analyze how objects are made, who makes them, and the physical or social conditions involved in their making. Next slide. Pilar also usurps the tropes of color theory, substituting a skin tone palette for prismatic colors to draw attention to complex issues around skin color. Her works could be seen as racialized abstractions and consider social dynamics and colorism within our culture. Through them, Pilar invokes the viewer to consider the inequities of race, gender, and class by presenting them with specific cultural and aesthetic experiences. In representing ideas of othering and conditions of otherness, she calls attention to marginalized cultural, cultural and aesthetic experiences to validate them and acknowledge their power. If you would like to see the Stratum exhibition, it will be on view at Cabrillo Gallery until October 28th. If you want to keep up with all of our programming, but you're not, but you're not receiving our email newsletters, there's a form on our website, home, website homepage where you can subscribe to get all the latest updates on our exhibitions and talks. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. But wait, there's more. Pilar will be offering a demo on Harachi making and a leather weaving workshop next Thursday, October 13th from noon to 1.30 at the gallery. You can register in advance by emailing us at the gallery. Next slide. I also want to let you know what's coming up at the gallery because this is a wildly popular show that everybody gets involved with and you can be in it too. Uh, it's our final exhibition of this semester and it's the 12 by 12 open invitational and it's an open call which means that everybody's welcome to put their work in the show for a fee of course um, there's a link to the exhibition page and a prospectus um, on this on and it will be in the chat okay um, all right and now i'd like to introduce our artist let's Spotlight Pilar here. Uh, okay. Never mind. Okay. Originally from Boyle Heights, Boyle Heights in East Los Angeles, Pilar was exposed to the potential and richness of materials and the love of hand making, handmade working in her parents' shoe shop. She received a BA in art from the University of California, Santa Cruz and an MA from San Jose State University. 
Pilar Esparza has been an active artist, arts educator, and arts administrator in the Bay Area, exhibiting her work in numerous institutions, including the San Jose Museum of Art, the Triton Museum, the Yerbas Buena Center for the Arts, the Santa Cruz Museum, the uh, MACLA, Palo Alto Arts Center, Galleria de la Raza, and the De Young Museum. In 2017, her work was featured in the exhibition, The US-Mexico Border, Place, Imagination, and Possibility at the Craft Contemporary Museum in Los Angeles as part of the Getty Foundation, Southern California Initiatives, Pacific Standard Time, LA, LA an ambitious exploration of Latin American and Latino art. In 2019, the US Bor Mexico border exhibition traveled to Lille, and I hope I'm saying that right, Lille, France, as part of the El Dorado Lille 3000 Arts Festival. Pilar has received an Artist Laureate Award from San San Silicon Valley Creates, San Jose, and was honored with the Outstanding Women of Silicon Valley Award. She received a public arts commission from the city of San Jose for La Vida and Los Dichos, Life in Proverb, Proverbs at the Biblioteca Latinoamericana branch of the San Jose Public Library, for which she received a national rec recognition given to the best public art projects annually by Americans for the Arts, Public Art New York Year in Review in 2000. She has done artists in residency at 01 Biennale at, at San, in San Jose, and was very recently a Lucas Artist Fellow at Montalvo Art Center in Saratoga, California, for which she created a new work of color, a very large scale, commissioned for the exhibition, Claiming Space, Refiguring the Body and Landscape, which will be on display until January 15th, 2023. Welcome, Pilar, it's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Beverly. It's, it's really great to have you to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm really grateful that um, you gave me the opportunity to exhibit my work in the gallery. Uh, a really Pleasure. Um, but thank you. And thank you to everyone who, who made it out for an evening talk. Really appreciate your presence. And um, hopefully it will be interesting. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and, I guess, um, share my screen. Well, Elise. Elise has. Would you stop sharing your screen, Elise? I am. OK, thanks. I'm going to just set up my slides. So give me a moment, and I will. A technical transition here. Yep. OK, so here we go. All right. And OK, so thanks again for the opportunity, Beverly. And, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here tonight. Um, yeah, so I did want to kind of I've been putting together my slides this afternoon and really trying to figure out, well, what are some of the, the, the most important things for people to know about my work and, and basically how it is that I've gotten to where I am now. And, and I think in, in really trying to put together my, my slides, uh, I think there were some very key things that, that happened in, uh, in terms of my practice and what I, I sort of discovered along the way in uh, 2010. So I do want to kind of start there as, as um, the last 12 years of, of me exploring, really meandering um, quite a bit of, of, of material territory, right? And conceptual uh, ideas as well in regards to color uh and and painting and sculpture and weaving so it's a little bit of a, a lot of these different things that have, have really converged in my practice so um i'm going to start there so so everybody you can see my slides beverly did it go to the crayons yes thanks okay. just checking because there's always like the technical thing with zoom right mm -hmm. yes <laughs> um so it, about 2010 um i re i came upon the Crayola Multicultural Crayon Pack, um, which is a, a skin tone set of colors. And I, th I think they actually had been in existence for some years prior to when I first came upon them. Uh, but it was really a fascinating thing to, to um, you know, as an educator yeah. with young kids um, at the beginning of my um, teaching experience, um, 
that I was like, wow, if, if at the same time, I, my daughter uh, was 10 years old at the time that I found this Crayola color pack. And so I was very curious um, to, I was wondering like if she came upon these, these colors, um, this idea of skin tone, what color would she choose, right? Or how would she see them? How would she use them? So it was something that was really fascinating me. Um, and I wanted to kind of dive a little bit more in, into the potential of using these, the material for one thing, but also uh, just the idea of skin tone and color. Um, so one of the first things that I did in, in working with the crayons was, was wanting to make imagery, right? So what kind of imagery do you make with um, Crayola crayons that are about skin and skin color and race? Um, and at the time, around 2015, is when I was started to really dive deep of like, okay, so if I use that material to um, to create some drawings, so what would they look like? What would, would they be? What's the subject matter, really? Um, and at the time, uh, it was very recent, the Ferguson uprisings. Oh, excuse me, I need to turn the lights back on my, yeah. in my room. It just turned off. There you go. Um, so at the time for the Ferguson uprisings had just happened. And, and I felt that the imagery of hands up was something that we were seeing quite a bit, right, in, in the, the protests that had happened and, at the, and Ferguson. So some of the imagery that I created was by melting the crayons and then creating these stencil drawings with, with the material. So that was one of the things that I started to experiment. So what kind of imagery would connect to the ideas of, of skin color and race? and blackness and brownness and whiteness, right? Um, so these are some examples of that. But another thing that I was really drawn to in, in working with this material was actually casting my daughter's feet in each of the colors. So that's another thing that I was, there was an impulse and it was something that I just did. It's like, I need to do that. So I did create this other piece um, in which I basically bought hundreds of packs of these crayons, separated all the colors, and then had my daughter pati patiently work with me as I cast each of, of uh, her pair of feet right in each of the colors. Um, and it was something that I did, again, just very intuitively. I was able to then it, um, create this piece that I've shown and I've also um, made two castings uh, of her feet. And the first one when she was 10 years old and it was a gesture where it was, she was very patient and also not necessarily engaged in a way um, that was a little bit more collaborative. Um, so I recast her feet and I asked her, can you do work with me again? And um, when she was 17, almost turning 18, we did a second round of castings because it was all, again, an impulse that I, I felt something drawn to as a mother and also a marking time, a certain amount of sentimentality. But I was also trying to understand if you are, if, if you are asked these questions, what color are you, what, your, what will your answer be? Um, so subsequently, I have been able to showcase just recently in the spring, these two series of castings of my daughter's feet. And with, with them, um, along with the castings, I also have installed a kind of mural size painting, right, with them that are basically the first one of the multicultural crayons, which is the wall piece. Uh, in the background, um, I wanted to create this idea of a large skin tone uh, chart, right? That the viewer can come upon and then answer that question. So what color are you? And the fascinating thing about me when I first installed this piece at Makla, because I originally uh, created it in 2015 and installed it at Makla, is that seeing people um, move their arm around all the colors and have this physical kind of interaction with the piece, which I was really thrilled about, right? Because it was um, interesting to have the, the reason that her feet are there was to bring the body presence, right, into, into the work. Um, the castings that are in the foreground of this photograph are, um, are from the second casting when she was almost 18 years old, in which I felt was a lot more of a collaborative experience. And uh, Olivia uh, was in the dance program at her high school and was very much involved in dance in high school. So it was about dance and conversation, right? I was wanting to collaborate with her and actually talk to, to her about race and talk to her about issues of skin tone and colorism and how she experiences that. Um, and um, so this was, this is kind of a duo type of um, 
pieces, part A, part B, that really kind of helped me to, to get into the idea of colorism, as well as the origins being the skin tone crayon pack. But in these pieces, I also was really, in, um, when I saw the, the skin tone chart, I, I realized that these, these were large abstractions, right? So the, one of the other things that was really exciting to me when I painted the wall in these stripes is that they're abstractions and also related to the weaving in that they're almost like a line, a stripe, a lace um, in, in their marking. So I was really excited about all of those kind of uh, connections that I could make within um, the practice of, of, of actually weaving, which this is just another view of that piece. It's a little bit closer. But subsequently too, the muralism has been something that um, as a Chicana artist, uh, the, the mural tradition is, is, is huge in our community. So I have had the opportunity to do other wall works and, and also and thinking about, okay, so this is a mural, this is an abstraction, and coming into and using weaving patterns as a basis for abstract work. Uh, so this was a piece that I have shown also at Makla in 2018. So again, kind of meandering between painting and, and working with leather. But I did want to go to the next um, slide here. The weaving part uh, was really something that was also, again, another project that I did in 2010. And this was in, in collaboration with a very good friend of mine by the name of Hector Dionisio Mendoza, who is actually an amazing sculptor. And he's a professor just down the road from Cabrillo. He teaches at uh, Cal State Monterey. We, we had been working and doing different uh, collaborations, a little smaller, um, but as soon as I told him, I started to get to know him, and I, as soon as I told him that I knew how to weave huaraches and that I grew up in a shoemaking family, he just looked at me and was like, why aren't you working with leather? And uh, I, I said, you know, I, it's true. I'm not sure how it is that I do that yet, I, and I want to, but I'm not sure how to do that. So. In the spirit of working with him and also in our a collaborative type of experiences, uh, we came up with this idea of actually going down to my parents' shop in, um, in Los Angeles and uh, doing a residency with them. And it, it became a commission that we presented at the 01B Annual and uh, did a residency also called Out of the Garage, uh, in which after doing the summer residency with my parents, um, we were able to then bring those materials uh, back with us and, and do a residency during the 01 B annual of 2010 uh, that fall. So that was a very interesting experience too, because all of a sudden we put the hats on of like, we're, we're shoemakers too, right? We're Wadacha makers. And uh, it was really fun working with him with that. But I do have a, a small video that we produced with the experience as well. Um, we work with a local a director um, and producer, Trisha Creason Valencia from Flaca Films. Uh, so I want to do a little shout out to her too. So I want to just kind of bounce over to uh, the video. Beverly, did it go to the video on the screen or are you not seeing it? No, we're not seeing that. Okay, so I'm just going to stop share and go back because I think that's one of the things that I, I know we kind of lose the connection when you do that. So yeah, let me go back here. I'll bring back. Do you see? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, because it pops out to a different okay, so window. Yeah, it goes to the window and then you lose it. So I'm just going to show a few segments of this. It's about a 10 minute long, but I don't think we have time to see it all. So I just want to show you a few little highlights here uh, for me. So I'm just going to cue it up a little bit. <laughs> Ya está todo en la tachola. No te veo. No, 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 a third generation shoemaker, both his father and then his grandfather worked in that trade. That aspect of being a third generation, 
Zapatero, I was very interested in, in, in trying to connect with him in that way because I'm a maker. And even though I chose to be a visual artist, I, I wanted to have that connection as a, someone who's interested in making things. So that's a little bit of, of introduction just to my parents and their shop, right? Which is it was filled with leather all over the place. It was just a, uh, this kind of tanglement of material. And that's really how I grew up, right? With all these kinds of machines going and, but the leather just as, as you could just imagine the smells, right? Of the leather, super strong in my memory. I wanted to get up a little bit, a little bit farther down here. Um, so this, um, this is my friend, Dio, who I mentioned worked with me on this project. And just gonna cue it up to my here. So you're gonna hear a little bit from him kind of working with some of the machinery too that we were, we were learning to, to use. Same one, the bottom of your water. Let's take this one. I'm very much uh, fascinated with throwaway materials because there's an abundance of, of throwaway materials here in this country. I and mean, we are a glutton society that tends to you know, consume, consume and buy and discard. So I'm interested in, in going and, and reclaiming those materials and transforming them into something completely different. Yeah, All right, cool. You can kind of see, right, that it's a place where my parents would recycle things like tires, and, which is a really great idea too, right? Like, wow, this is really cool. So we would be gathering in the, the back of the shop a lot of these tires that could be then cut out to, to create the soles of the huaraches. Um, let me get a couple other parts now. When I want to just show you little parts of the entry that we, we did with my parents. Um, I think a big imp impulse also to do this particular project was to be able to record a little bit of their story, right? What it is that, why did they start doing, making huaraches in, in Los Angeles? Yo trabajaba más en los zapatos, de, de, para hacer zapatos de, para personas de descanso, de zapatos así de, de mujeres, o sea, para, como dicen, o para viejitas. Entonces les gustaban. Pero empecé a coser huaraches allí en el taller y la gente empezó a mirar. Y me pedían mucho, pues entonces fue cuando ya mandé traer hormas de México y todo eso ya para poner, ya poner las líneas de guarache. Y, ahí, y ahí, después pues ya he ido mejorando, comprando más fierros para... El chiste de aquí es automatizarse para poder sacar producción, si no, no sale producción. Porque pues, a todo, pues tú, la, la, lo mero el secreto pues del guarache es el te, la tejida. So that's a little bit of me just doing the weaving, right? That we were able to record the process um, of making the actual weaving part of the shoe, which is probably one of the most laborious things as well. But I love what he said ends there, like the secret of making watches is the weaving. And so that was really, again, one of the other ideas that in, in are we back to the PowerPoint, Beverly? Yes, yes. And being able to to work with them, get their story, uh, was also again thinking about all the different kind of relationships of the material right, that I was trying to make in the connections. Because one strand was the skin tone, colorism, a group of colors that represent skin, and then the other was you know the background that I have with my parents and what I learned in their shop, right? Because when I went to UC Santa Cruz, I studied painting, right? So I was going to be a fine artist. I, you know, went, and what did that mean? Well, I was going to be learning about Western, the Western tradition of painting, and I was super excited about it. And, and that's what I did. But I always had the impulse to create something more three-dimensional with my work. Either I start to make elaborate frames or I'd start to, to want to add more things. And, and as the years went by, this is sort of like felt going, being able to go back to to my parents' shop, being able to do this experience of, of the residency with them. And then ultimately coming back to my studio, bringing back all these materials and, and basically telling myself, 
this is what I have to make art. The, you know, the things that I have here, the paint that I've had from the past, you know, that from my training as a painter, and then all these materials that are also from my past, right? Growing up in a shoemaking family. So if this is the materials that make art, what would I create? So that's sort of the, the, the construct that I, that I um, put together for myself, right? Of like, this is what you, you need to, to sort of stay in this zone. Um, so the conversation has really been in really examining then how, how weaving is a lot about abstraction, right? And the tradition of painting. So it, that's how I started to, to get into cr not creating imagery per se that's representational, but really being able to see weaving and abstraction as, as a, uh, a way that I could paint, right? So some of these are in the exhibition of Stratum uh, and, and this being one of the, the early paintings of almost like looking at pixelation too, right? Of being able to see skin in very tiny amounts, but zooming out, zooming in uh, was something that was really interesting to me too. Because the idea of stratum was thinking about hierarchies, right? So what kind of skin tone has more value than others, right? It's the lightness. It's, the darkness is not good, the lightness is better, right? So in colorism, that's really what that's about, right? This other piece called stratum merging was when I was starting to see, well, it's the painting in abstraction, but I could also bring the actual material of leather into the work too, and seeing them as abstractions. Again, the line, the lace of the line um, that's created by lace, leather lace is like an abstract line. So weaving then the kind of nature of being able to, to bring that material was very specific to, to my practice. And, and kept going back and forth, right? Stratum six, either the lines are painted onto the, the canvas or they're the lines. So the, the painting is a lot more here versus like this piece, which is the actual leather nailed to the side of the, of the canvas and then really spread across the, the canvas board. So I really enjoyed being able to, to kind of go back and forth right so it's either painting or it's actually working with the material but it's painting still like nonetheless it, it is related to painting stratum blue because the other thing too in making skin tone paintings i'm like okay i just want to work with browns basically right but it's really hard not to bring in chromatic color right because ultimately it's like, gosh, being limiting yourself just to browns, that's hard. But it was really like, oh, I just want, if I had a little contrast color, it would, the image all, all of a sudden really sparkles, right? It comes to light. So much of my exploring that has also been like, so what is, how does chromatic color also fit into some of these paintings, some of these weavings? So you could see this leather, leather and acrylic paint piece. Another thing too, like with this particular piece was using all the different ways and strategies that you make shoes. So some of the experimentation I have done uh, right on the canvas panels is um, using the foot form and the way that you need to uh, indicate the holes where you're going to weave through um, the leather and the foot form that you create. So sometimes when I work with the panels, what I liked of working with wood versus a canvas panel is that you can start to nail into it or you can drill into it and that becomes part of the construct to create these. So this is almost like a shoe form, right? Weaving into it, that, but, it's, but it's a painting um, evolving from that. I, I feel like so my experimentation that is on view right now in the Stratum exhibition is just really the beginning for me. Um, I, I, there's so much that I want to explore with, with the material and actually go with bigger scale. But a lot of these that I've done in the last several years, uh, or the last few years, have been smaller in scale because leather's kind of, it's expensive, right? And most of the leather that I've been working with is all the remnants that my parents uh, basically left when they retired, right? Um, so I've just been slowly working with these and kind of making different pieces. So um, the three-dimensionality though, I think is, again, there's a lot of potential there. So some of um, like this in particular, the frame underneath it is leather 
when you wet leather and you let it dry, if you form it in a certain way, it will stay taut, right? So that aspect of it is, is really cool too. So again, part of me, I feel like I've only scratched the surface as to how, how I can be working with this, these materials. You know, and ultimately too, I, I love, I love artists that are working uh, with race, about race. And uh, Carrie James Marshall is a big art hero of mine, right? His paintings are incredible. It's, it's just such, such incredible handling of the form, of the human form. And, but being able to illustrate the black experience, right? And being able to paint blackness and black people, but in their intensity of color, right? That um, I've learned a lot from looking at his painting. So this piece that the leather um, lace that I was working with was a black color, but I was really wanting to explore the black colors that uh, Carrie James Marshall has used to illustrate his, his figures and his paintings and found that like, there's all these subtleties of, of color, right? Within the one color alone. Uh, can have all these permutations. So that's I really wanted to keep it in that color range. So this is this is a, a lesson from Carrie James Marshall. Some of the skinned works that are also in the exhibition um, are working with the canvas. Uh, either the painting is underneath the leather or the painting is on top of the leather a little bit more in a flat way, like this skins one, it's one of the first ones that I did, um, or completely covers the panel. Like this is all of the panels completely covered with leather here. And then the um, gel medium is poured onto it. Acrylic uh, is then painted onto it. I've also been ex experimenting with acrylic that's specifically for leather and for shoes, because I brought so much of it back from our residency uh, with my parents. So. That's been, it's been fun to, to explore all the different ways because it's a different consistency than when you buy acrylic paint for painting itself, right? But the other thing that's been really fun uh, with acrylic is I've been using house paint too, right? Since I do a lot of wall, wall mural works. So in my canvas for uh, panel paintings that are smaller, it could, be, uh, it could be acrylic that's shoe paint. It could be acrylic that's traditional painting um, paint from like Liquitex or golden paints, or it could be from Kelly Moore, right? Um, my acrylic wall paint. I did wanna share uh, the recent project that I did at Montalvo because it also uh, has um, one, it was a wonderful project to uh, be invited to create a, co a commissioned work, uh, but invited to participate in the exhibition. Um, outdoor exhibition that was uh, organized by Kelly Sakat, and um, who's the director of the Montalvo Arts, um, Lucas Arts Residency Program, as well as uh, Donna Conwell, who's the curator uh, at uh, Montalvo Arts Center. And in, in coming in working with them, um, our first visit with them to talk about the show, as well as look at the grounds to consider where I could create a piece uh, when they brought me to the area that's called the Italianate Garden, which is at the base of Montalvo, if you know the Villa Montalvo um, um, Center Park area, it's a, it has a beautiful front lawn in front of this villa, historic villa, and at the base of it is a gated garden. But so when you go in there, they say it's they keep it gated because they, it's a very particular sort of aesthetic that they wanted to set up, um, as, as well as keep the deer from eating all the roses because um, they wanted to have like more of the this sort of traditional garden. And um, there's a lot of deer at Montalvo, so they, if they let it open, they, they have to gate it for, from, the, uh, from the deer. But anyway, in that garden, uh, there's these uh, sculptures. Um, and this in particular, Adam and Eve by Francesco Fabini Altini, that is part of the original co collection of the um, Phelan, uh, who, who was actually the owner of Montalvo in, in the early 20th century. So this is one of the works that he collected and um, was really kind of showcasing there uh, at, at his villa. 
So they were interested in like, okay, they showed me that sculpture. Or would you be interested in doing, have, being in conversation with it, basically doing a treatment to it, maybe we're making a leather piece. And when, after thinking about it, I really did like the idea of being, creating a piece specifically for that garden. But ultimately, I didn't want to necessarily do anything to as an intervention to that piece, but rather create a piece that would be in conversation with it, kind of more approximately uh, close to that piece. So you, I like this photograph because you kind of you can see my piece from um, the sculpture of, of Adam and Eve. And basically, too, within the um, let me kind of close some of these windows within the this this beautiful uh, manicured Italianate garden is is a very particular aesthetic. That's very Western. That's very European. And the the sculptures as well as behind behind the structure, there's these Greek columns that are also kind of featured as part of the garden space. So it's a very European kind of treatment. And I said, no, I want my piece to be there because I wanted to, again, to be in conversation with the garden, but I also wanted to be in conversation with the whiteness that this whole garden represents, right? And this kind of European tradition. Uh, in making my piece, I, I, I knew I wanted to create something that was pretty large scale, but I also wanted to create something that was uh, almost like a mural. So instead of thinking of materials that were like stone or something that's more sculptural in that sense, I decided to create a painting on canvas. Um, so let me get to the next slide here. Oops. So this is a little bit of a closer view of my piece of color, which is acrylic on canvas that uh, has been woven in these uh, kind of more traditional weaving patterns. And the, there's two sides to it because the other thing too, I, I created this mural wall, but I didn't want it to just be one-sided, right? I, need, I wanted it to be more of an object. So it's kind of a sculpture, it's kind of a painting. And I was really excited about those sort of dualities of it. So I wanted the piece to definitely be, encourage people to see it as they're walking on the path, but encourage them to walk around it as well. So it is a, um, a piece that you can go in and, and walk around. So the shape of it was very important to me as well. Like I didn't want it to be just a wall that was straight um, and, and more of a barrier, although it does create a barrier because it's quite big. It's seven feet tall and about 20 feet long in length, but I want it to be a little softer. And, and so the, the shape of it was really important to me. And when it finally occurred to me that I'd want it to be like an S curve, like a, a serpentine shape. Um, it was always been really fun to think about that the serpent uh, that's at the base of Adam and Eve in the, um, in the traditional sculpture is also in conversation with the serpentine sculpture that I created here and placed at Montavo. So let me show you a couple more images of some close-ups that you can kind of see the weaving pattern. So the skin tone side does have that more, a little bit more traditional weaving pattern that's it's all the way across uh, the piece on that one side. Um, and some of the patterning was definitely influenced by the work that I've done with my parents and, and, and the Huarache patterning that um, I learned from them. But on the other side, when you walk around the other side, it, it, the base of the piece starts with the skin tone palette, but then I, I'm coming in and wanting to have more of a conversation with abstraction again and, and using chromatic color uh, as part of, of it. So it, on one side, it's a little bit quieter. It's a little bit maybe more somber that people are like, wow, what is this? This is like a really ethnic feel kind of piece. But when you then walk around it, you get a little bit of surprise maybe, right? That all of a sudden color is a big part of, of what is also included with the skin tone palette. So here I'm gonna show a, a couple more views of it as you can kind of get a sense of the scale. There's some, there's some folks that are walking in front of it on the top picture but it's a, it was a pretty big piece, but I was really excited about being able to um, create a work that could be freestanding uh, in this space, but be definitely in conversation with what this space means and represent uh, kind of the body in an abstract way, right? Because it is a, um, 
this, this giant abstract painting to me, abstract mural. Uh, but yet it's also in conversation with the idea of craft, right? Of something that is woven, that is a tradition that maybe is not necessarily seen as a high art, but yet it is something that takes about a lot of time, uh, has its own artistry to me and, um, and wanted to be able to mark that as well. The handmade at this scale also gives you an idea of what it takes to create that in a, in a laborious way and about labor and about people who are working with their hands. Um, so all of these ideas uh, are then really kind of encapsulated in this piece for me. Um, these were kind of very different um, pieces, but I thought like maybe I'd share them quickly because after I, I created that piece, I was able to, to continue my residency for a few more weeks and I moved into one of the LucasArts studios um, and the artists who had been there prior to my stay uh, by uh, uh, an artist by the name of Kim Yasuda, who's a professor of uh, social practice art at um, UC Santa Barbara. She actually left me a piece and she said, well, could you collaborate with me? Would you like to, to do this? And she, she left a beautiful, um, very simple string and uh, uh, these beautiful kind of bark of a tree. You can kind of see it here on the left that reminded her of skin color. I was like, wow, this is a really beautiful little installation that she left. And she's like, hey, if you, if you don't mind collaborating with me, it'd be great. So you could start interacting with, with the piece in some way and just documenting it. So we've had this little exchange, but this was when I, I'm just showing this piece because this is related to then the latest um, wall work that I have in, at, in the Stratum exhibition as well as I, this was a small warp that I used to test some of my ideas of how to create the large weaving at Montalvo. And I decided to play with it and I turned it on its side. And after doing that, I, I really got excited about the potential to, to, to have a piece look like that, create something that would drape in that way. And um, so these are just a couple of views of, of the two ideas of, of Kim's piece and then me putting together the warp and turning it to, to drape this way was really what was some of the inspiration to then create this piece at, um, at Cabrillo. So I think another thing that's been really exciting about the opportunity to have a show is to have wall space that is big and then be able to then envision something to create specifically for that space. So I'll turn my lights back on here. Um, I think that ends my slides. Thank you so much, Pilar, that was wonderful. Um, well, we have a couple more slides to put up. Um, if it's not too awkward to do that, or we could skip that. What do you think, Elise? Would you like to just skip the slide or get them back up again? Um, I'm happy to put them up, but I'm not seeing the slide that has the links. Oh, okay. So I just see the slide that has the question and answer. Okay, um, see if I've got it here. All right. But I did add the links in the chat if anybody okay, is yes. interested. So um, all the links are in there, yes. Yeah. So I just did I did want to remind you uh, about um the show being up. I'll just I'll just verbally go through this. Um the show being up through October 28th. And um the links are in the chat to find us, to find the gallery webpage, to find Pilar's website to find the link for the Horachi making demo and leather weaving workshop next week, and then how to um, stay in touch with us. And we're gonna move on to the Q&A now. And uh, during the Q&A, um, you can unmute yourself to um, ask a question, or you can just add questions into the chat and we'll address those from there. Uh, and then also, if you want to unmute yourself to, to actually speak, and don't know how to do that, if you go to your picture on the Zoom uh, grid and click on the little dots in the upper right hand corner, you will see um, unmute or ask to unmute and we'll unmute you. Um, so that's how we're gonna do the Q&A. So now we're gonna, um, we have to end the spotlight on Pilar so we can see everybody. Hang on a second, and spotlight, there we go. Okay, here we all are, all right. So does anybody have a question to start with? Uh, 
Okay, Vic well, just answered, can... Vic, this is Andre. Vic just Good. answered mine in the chat. I was in your piece uh, of color at Montavo. I was just trying to understand what you were weaving because I was looking at your definition, acrylic, canvas, and still frame. And then luckily Vic mentioned you are weaving the canvas. So, cause I was like, you said leather's expensive. And um, so I'm glad to know it's canvas. And the second thing, is this a permanent installation that's gonna be up in their uh, garden? Well, actually um, it's actually up through January 15th now. So it's not a permanent feature. Um, and we're also keeping an eye on it because most of the sculptures that are on display for this particular exhibition are more the uh, traditional metal or stone kind of materials that can be outside. So um, we're keeping an eye on it. And if we start seeing that there's a, a little bit too much deterioration or it's changing too much too drastically, we're going to go ahead and, and take it down because uh, it is outdoor house paint that I painted the canvas with. So um, it's been holding up really well. And it, the frame is steel, stainless steel that it, it's um, Velcroed, rested on, draped on. Um, I did the piece in quadrant. So it's uh, there's four pieces that I put together, two for each side. Um, and so it's holding up really nicely. And so we're still pretty happy with it. And would I would love to be able to stay in the show through through the run. But um, again, we might have to take it down if the weather uh, starts to beat it up too much. Um, but yes, uh, Andre, I was, um, was a little concerned with making, I mean, with my budget to create the piece, I, that it would be cost, it would have been cost prohibitive to work with leather at that scale. But I also was, a I didn't, the conversation was not I didn't think was was important to have at that scale that much leather it was I was feeling I would want to do that right that's a lot of animals so I didn't really feel good about that and that was not the conversation that I really wanted to have so I decided that I didn't want to make it out of leather even if I would have had the budget that was that's not something that really sat well with me mm -hmm. and it was interesting I was having a conversation with Pilar in the gallery about the painted canvas because it's the same material that is in that big installation piece plus the weaving that she did on site on the back side of the gallery and it's it's amazing to see how much it does look like the painted leather I mean the painted canvas and a certain light can really look like skin um, so it really carries through this this whole idea with the skin colors and the skin texture yeah, and I think that's kind of why I've been really fascinated. I've restricted my palette, but at the same time, there's a lot of potential, right? Like, okay, so then the color is skin, but it, the color looks like leather, right? And then these materials have all these, these sort of crossing over, right? And, and connections so, uh, of their materials. So that's what have been, has been one, something that's really exciting to me, right? Being able to connect to those things that, um, how, how the potential of the material can take you to these ideas. Um, I see a question from John that um, asking me whether my parents consider themselves artists or shoemakers. And that's a really great question because I do think that my parents, especially my father, um, shoemaker, right? Wasn't necessarily seeing himself as an artist. And, and ultimately my father was a businessman, right? He had to feed his family. And one of the things he wanted a lot of freedom to be able to also, you know, work when he needed to. And so having his own shop was something that he was really interested in, 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 in doing for the independence. Um, but not that my father didn't appreciate the arts, he really did. And he had a, a lot of his siblings back in Mexico actually were artists, were, were painters. I have uncles who, I had an uncle who was a watercolor artist and, um, so there, there was arts in the family, but I, I thought one of the things that he also was very much attuned in besides trying to make a living and being having more independence was that he was also very attuned to the power, the signifying power of Huaraches to the communities outside of Mexico, right? So he knew that in LA, there was, there was a real interest in, in, in immigrants connecting 
to their homeland. And the, the Warache, this very particular footwear would provide that kind of nostalgia as well as connection to their homeland. So I was really intrigued by him really articulating that and thinking about that, right? Because it's like, I can really, you know, do something with that. I have this skill and I wanna do that. But um, seeing himself as an artist, I, I don't think so, right? Um, but it's a great question, great question. Are there any other questions? Because I know I have some. Uh, uh, hello, Pilar, and um, thank you for presenting. I wanted to ask you about, um, there was a particular work that was mentioned at the uh, beginning of your presentation um, or part of your introduction about a piece that was on the American and Mexican border. Uh, I was interested just in hearing more about that piece. Yeah, so the, the actual works that were in that exhibition in Los Angeles uh, and then subsequently traveled to Lille were actually shoes that we had designed, um, Theo and myself had created, um, because part of the residency for me was like, we're all in, we're shoemakers right now, right? And we're going to take the trade and figure out how to do that. And growing up with the weaving, um, I, I, as a child, I was like, I was weaving and, you know, it could be kind of boring and it was something that I had to do, but going back and seeing, it's like, no, I'm a shoemaker. And what would I design? What would be my artistry? And I, unfortunately, I don't have any examples of those um, types of shoes that I created. The the sandals that I, styles that I made, but I had fun with color, right? A lot of the, my designs had a lot more weaving, traditional weave, but with color. And Dio and I did a couple of collaborative shoes that we were just going, because he was riffing on some other really fun stuff. Like we created waraches out of um, flippers, right? Swimming flippers, and then we would treat them with weaving on them. So we were having fun with kind of seeing, again, the, the craft as well as design and art Kind of having conversations, functionality, non-functionality, um, something that you can use that's utilitarian and something that's just a sculpture, right? Um, so that was really fun. And, and I really felt like I, I needed to do that. So to, to kind of see myself as a, as a shoemaker as well. See, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's, a, that's, even, yeah, that's really fantastic. Any other questions in the audience? Yes, Doreen. How far into your art career as an artist did was it when you realized you could be working in leather? Yeah, Doreen, you know, I it was probably, I mean, I was already 12 years ago, so it was already in my 40s, like early 40s. And I, you know, I studied painting right out of high school at UC Santa Cruz. So I had been doing painting and then some sculpture works. When I went back to do my MFA at, at uh, San Jose State, it was in spatial art. And so I really wanted like, okay, start deep dive on, on, on more sculptural work, right? But um, so I worked with Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, who's an amazing weaver herself. And um, interestingly enough, I didn't do weaving with her. I actually did sewing with her. I was interested in, in, again, working with my hands, but learning how to sew and working with, with paper and creating sculptures through using those techniques of paper and, and, um, and sewing kind of craft focused as well, kind of women's work too. Um, at the time, my daughter was about two years old when I started my MFA program. And again, it, it's, you know, being a mom and, and having kids and trying to keep a practice, it's pretty challenging, right? So I ended up, she became part of my art, right? She trying to be with her and raise her and, and see through her eyes as well. So for instance, one of the, my projects, I think my thesis project was uh, creating a sculpture out of a year's worth of her homework, first grade homework, right? So it was this giant homework house that um, I did almost like a quilt style, right? And had to figure out kind of technically, how do I make this really stand up on its own? So that was really fun to do. But um, again, kind of trying to see, to me, it was a lot about trying to see the potential of materials and meaning, right? So it had to be her homework. And the thought that, it, you know, this was like a five foot high by a, a six foot long little tent house. It's like, so thinking of like, here's a first grader doing that much rote homework, right? This is pretty crazy. <laughs> it's like, what are our kids doing? So I really like the, the idea of, of making that kind of visible in a different way, right? In this kind of little structure. 
but uh, again, those were some of my meanderings. And so really going into the leather and it was something that was hard for me. Like, how do I make that jump? And so that my, my friendship with um, Dio Mendoza was really important because he very much supported me getting into, into working with leather. And so that's how um, us putting together the residency was, was super important. And, and recording my parents' story was very important too, making that little 10 minute video, doing the interviews. Uh, unfortunately, my mom passed away the very next year. So in 2011, my mom passed away and my father passed away in 2017. So having done, having captured their story and uh, done the recordings was, was even more important, you know, after that, shortly after that. Well, if, if uh, people would hang on just a minute, I've got some questions <laughs> and we can continue a little bit longer. Um, so when you first discovered the multi multicultural crayon pack um, and started working with those particular colors, was there anything you found like disappointing or like odd, very odd to you about the colors? Yeah, and it was working with the crayons. It was very frustrating because for a while, I had my daughter's feet in my studio right after casting that first casting that I did. And so I was like, wow, these are interesting. Maybe I could draw with them. So here I was making drawings with the giant foot, right? Like trying to put it on the paper. Um, because again, it's kind of like, well, this is what I, I'm making art with, right? At the time. And that wasn't very satisfying. It wasn't until I started to melt the wax and pour it onto paper and then brush it on and, and remove it and use a heat gun and kind of reactivate it. That was, um, I was able to really get more of the material doing what I wanted it to do using stencils and what have you. Mm -hmm. But it, it was shortly after that. So I got some imagery out of that, but it was like, hmm. I started to cut up all, a lot of my extra um, drawings or scrap papers and started to weave just with the paper, the wax covered paper. So some of the, some of the drawings that are in the Stratum exhibition are some of those explorations. They're not leather, they're actually the wax uh, coated, crayon coated uh, paper. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, more specifically, the colors that are in the pack like it really comes clear when, when with that cast piece with the wall colors behind it, uh, you know, your daughter's feet, like that yellow color, nobody's that color. Yeah. <laughs> what are they thinking? You yeah. know, uh, and, and white, that pure white, you know, it just seemed odd to me. And I was wondering if it struck you the same way. Well, and I think the pack, the intention of the pack was, okay, you can use white as a crayon color to lighten or, oh, yeah. or black to darken the color, right? Yeah. But ultimately, when I started to work more with the skin tone set, I, I'm not using just white. That just seems weird, right? That is odd. Uh, yeah. So I abandoned the white, but it is a part of the pack. But I think that was more of the intention, certainly not the skin tone. But, but you know, it's an artificial thing too, right? Yeah. Really like that tan color, right? Like that's kind of a weird golden rod, yellow, browny kind of strange color, right? Yeah. But, I, but ultimately to me, seeing that range you right away go, oh, that's a skin tone chart, right? It's those yeah. together, like that range of them, that is, it's just a symbol. It's a symbol of something else. Yeah. So yeah. It, and it's it, on its own, it's kind of odd, but I feel like when you put them together, all of a sudden that's where the connection comes from. Mm -hmm. And so speaking of that kind of um, subverting the, the color um, chart, so to speak, the sort of traditional, um, modernist color chart. Um, and you're also using very modernist language in, in your formal approach to your work, um, you know, with these grids and, and other, you know, the diagonals and certain things that are very, very modernist formally, and which is sort of the territory of, you know, the old white guys kind of thing. But then you're throwing in these skin tone color palette, palette instead of what normally people would, would have used. So, um, well, that's kind of more of a comment than a question, but um, did that, was that a conscious choice or were you, yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I always wondered why I loved minimalism for the longest time when I was working representationally, but all the artists that I really loved were like Eva Hess, mm -hmm. Agnes Martin, right? Donald Judd, <laughs> these like minimalist artists, right? These creating minimalist works. Like, why am I so fascinated with that? Um, and so then when I d discovered the weaving and the tradition of weaving, it's like, well, these are, these are modernist 
techniques, right? And then I think of um, Joseph Albers, right, with color theory or um, Annie Albers with weaving, right? When I discovered her, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the two of them, right? Uh, doing this and seeing, seeing craft, but yet recognizing that their total influence in modern, modernist, um, the modernist vocabulary, right? Of working with the grid, working with the basis of this is how you create imagery, but that's all really based in weaving, I think. Oh yeah. So to me, it's super fascinating because that is more of the, you know, although the modernist, the minimalist that I really that I'm attracted to are the females, right? Uh. And Terrell, like these, these are the the the, the, uh, the artists that I'm really excited about because they're not male, but at the same time, when I'm looking at them, well, yeah, it is the tradition, kind of the male artist canon of abstraction. Mm -hmm. But I kind of like that. It's kind of trying to subvert that in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you'll indulge me just a little longer. So the Strat Emerging piece, which is what is on our announcement, um, this I saw it, I immediately thought flag. Now, was that your intention as you made the piece or did that just happen afterwards that because of the visual? relationship there yeah you know the um i didn't i wasn't thinking flag at all right but it was one of those things that um in creating the two separately but being able to see like oh no these go together right it was this impulse like oh no these go together and and then that gesture for me was super exciting right because then i was like i can i can do work this way and it, it makes sense to me visually mm -hmm. same thing of like the piece that's in the exhibition that um, are, are very small, the same kind of size panels, and it's a black weave, and it's that kind of peach color weave. And I made those separately and had them in my studio kind of just as single pieces. But one day I'm like, wait a minute, these two go together as well, right? As like a black and white, right? But again, it's the idea of white, right? Because it's not the white of the Crayola pack, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like this chromatic white. It's, it's what we think of in skin tone when we say, oh, white person, right? Oh, yeah, right. it's a colored, colored person, right? Mm -hmm. um, peach <laughs> in the in the Crayola pack or what have right. you. Right. Or the old name for it was flesh. <laughs> right. <laughs> they can't do that anymore. <laughs> that was from like the 60s or, or growing up. I remember it'd be like flesh. Oh, whose flesh is this? Yeah, right. Exactly all the conversation to me that I think is super fascinating right yeah yeah it is these things that we connect with words with vocabulary with terms that we use but yet you know because another thing that's really interesting to me is when we start talking about spaces right what's a white space what's a brown space what's a black space and this is like what what are you talking about and people like no it's a it's a space that people feel comfortable who associate with that connect with that with brownness or blackness or whiteness or whatever right uh, but to me that's really fascinating like these ideas are social ideas are really fascinating to me so i like to be able to to again it, it meander in and out influence my ideas as i create work mm -hmm. Because I do want it to connect to that in some way. Mm -hmm. So that leads nicely into the Carrie James Marshall piece. Um, so that to me also has a flag like shape. I mean, that's what I kind of read it in a sense as. Um, but it also has a very sort of convoluted and complex weave that's kind of unsettled. It mm -hmm. has a lot of sort of uh, almost an unnerved feeling to it. Um, was that something that was intentional? Yes. Yes, I had that color and I was like, I was trying to anti-weave, right? Because mm. the one that's the strata merging is very much about over, under, over, under the patterning, right? Being able to really traditionally do that. But, you know, Beverly, I've, I've always like fought against the, the thought of myself as a weaver, mm -hmm. right? That I'm not really a weaver. And I've had friends like, what are you talking about? You grew up with it. This is, you're doing Arches, right? And I go, yeah, you're right. You know, I need to be able to allow myself to do that. But on the other hand, it's also like when I was a kid and having to weave, um, I didn't oh. want to do that, right? I was a little kid going, I don't want to weave. I'm like, you know, this is this is boring or this, I'm not good at it, right? I always felt like I, I was not good at weaving um, because there's a lot of patterning that you have to do, right? And you have to stay with the pattern. And I would do something, it's like, oh, I forgot a one or I missed a step. And that would be really frustrating. But I think it was kind of a rebellious thing too, right? So that piece that you're talking about is definitely one where I was like, I am not making a pattern. I am not creating a sequence that will repeat so I wanted it to have this sort of visceral quality to it. And 
it's also the, the kind of what I think is also associated with blackness, right, in our culture. There's always this kind of like, Although to me, Carrie Jones and James Marshall shows us the beauty of blackness, right? The, the power of blackness. Uh, and, and yet there's so much strife about that in our culture too. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, it's that, the greatest. That really, sorry, I interrupted you there. Mm -hmm. That piece really spoke to me of that. Mm -hmm. And it really hit me that way. So um, I just wanted to confirm that that's where it's coming from. Well, I definitely, that's definitely what I was interested in, in in connecting with. So I'm glad you feel that way, Beverly. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all the questions I have. Um, does anybody else want to say anything else? Ask a question. All right. I um I would love to just say thank you so much. I really appreciated that you shared the video of your parents. Um, I thought that was really special and to really see their workshop and um, just to have that background information, I thought that was um, just a really nice addition to hearing more about your history and how you came to make what you've been making. Um, and I also really appreciate it at the end, because of that piece that's on that wall, the big, um, I forget the title of it right now, with the four canvas where it's hanging down, um, that piece really jumps out to me in the show. And I love that that was like an experiment where you came upon it, you know, just switching, you said it was like just kind of alternating the hanging uh, access of how you usually do your weaves. And I just also want to say, sorry, that although you're using lots of different materials in all of these pieces, from the paper with the melted crayon to the weaving and the leather and now the canvas that you seem to be kind of experimenting in that direction of, you know, maybe if I hang it this way, you know, and seeing what happens, um, there's still this really lovely, you can tell it's all of your work. You know, there's a, there's a connection and a, an, and a voice that you can see that speaks through all of the pieces um, so it's a really beautiful show and um, I'm honored to get to work around it. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Elise. That's really beautiful comments. I appreciate it. Well, well said, Elise. And yes, it, the show was just stunning. I can't say that enough. It's, it's visually striking, but also very thought provoking. And it's a, it's a joy to have you here. <laughs> And thank you so much for the talk. It was really wonderful. And thank everybody for coming. Um, I'm really glad you came to join us tonight. Yeah, and definitely. Hope to see some of you at the workshop next week. Thank you for presenting. Our no. pleasure. Thank you for coming, Evan. I love seeing my students here. <laughs> it's great. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Thanks again. Bye, Tony. It's kind of one of I'm reading some of the the comments here, like oh, the people who were here, yay, yeah, oh. I had some friends. This is great. It's lovely. It's so cool. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. they always sneak them in right at the end. <laughs> Good that you noticed them. Sorry, I was here too. Oh, she took off. I think. I don't <laughs> All right, that was great, Pilar. Oh. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you so much.